Uh, I just want to say one thing. Mike has been so helpful over the last couple of years in, in helping pry loose data from the Department of Health that we all pay for uh, in, in one way or another. Um, and he's really been stalwart in, 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 uh, in helping get those data and helping me do some very fundamental analyses that the Department of Health should have, should have done itself. Good evening, and thank you for everybody who put this together. May I close the stop time? Is that the Everything everyone before me said about politicians is 100% accurate. <laughs> Seriously. I'm an elected official, though, so it does not apply to me. <laughs> um, like all of you in this room, I found myself at a point where this very scary um, virus had been spoken about on the news, and we were warned about it. And it was at first. Wow. This is scary. It was scary to me. I'm immunocompromised. I'm one of one people in the world with the six diseases I have, and they all can kill me. And they can kill me with respiratory issues. So I was real scared at first. Then I got a phone call from a, a child I used to coach in, in youth athletics, whose parents both are physicians in very different disciplines, but who work in the same hospital in Rhode Island. And this, well, he's not a child anymore, <laughs> reflection of my age. Uh, th this kid, th this young man, was telling me, well, yeah, my parents have been uh, taking this drug prophylactically. And, you know, they're all doing it at the hospital. So I, that's kind of cool. Can you maybe ask them what it is? <laughs> I don't want to die. With my right hand to, to our maker, strike me if I'm lying. They're taking prophylactic hydroxychloroquine and high dose vitamin D for it. <laughs> this was very early 2020. At that point, and I apologize in advance if, if words that are inappropriate for children slip out, but I'm gonna do my best so that, that does not happen. At that point, I knew it was all a bunch of malarkey. And that was early on. But we had to do what we had to do. So, we invoked, oh, strike that, the governor at the time, Ray Mundo, invoked a wartime statute, a wartime law that gave her absolute power. Absolute power that this vile individual was so drunk with that she posted men with guns on our borders to stop people with New York license plates from entering our state. This is America. This is the United States of America. We are a republic. It's still America. It's still America. It is still America. We are a republic. We are a nation of laws. But with the stroke of a pen, those laws went into the to the waste heap. And we hear from businessmen, we hear from doctors, we hear from doctors who were impacted, and we hear their stories, and we can all relate. And I can look, I'm looking out at this crowd, I see nurses, I see other medical professionals, I see teachers, people I know who have all been screwed by this. We get to a point where we decide in our cowardly way that we're going to start doing our jobs as elected officials. Now, one of the first orders of business where I in charge would be to do what the legislature's responsibility was when this wartime statute is invoked, which is review it for its validity on a periodic basis and then strike it if it is, in fact, invalid. Very simple. It was a vote. It was a matter of a vote. 75 people, 113 people total, would raise their hands, either yay or nay. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. I still have colleagues to this day who are wearing masks. Now, I don't know, honest to God, I do not know if it's because they're still so scared of dying from a cold, or if they just 
hammered it down so damn hard that this was the right thing to do that they know how foolish they would be if they were to ever peel the mask off. I don't know what their issues are, but those people are still around us. When you're driving home tonight, you'll see them in their cars with the damn masks on by themselves. This was, in my opinion, one of the greatest human control experiments ever pulled off. But I was here, I was uh, asked to come here to speak about what we did or didn't do legislatively. I am a member of the House Oversight uh, Committee, one of the, I'm the longest serving member of the House Oversight Committee, but I'm also one of the members who's known to be probably the most uh, daring to go where others won't. And it's always respectful, mostly. <laughs> but it's always fair. 100% of the times, it's fair. I was also asked to sit on a COVID vaccine task force. That sounded pretty important. It sounded like a place where I could potentially make an impact. And then this little roly-poly fella comes in. And he sits down and testifies. And I said, Dr. McDonald. <laughs> we had Dr. Ja. We had the handsome Philip Chan. We had Dr. Alexander Scott, uh, we had Roly, and we had some others probably along the way. And I remember one time when I was a boy, my dad came from home from a deployment and he had this little toy and you could wind it up on the back, this little crank, and it would smack these symbols together and make a noise, just over and over again, that's all it did. And I swear to God, I thought I was receiving testimony from that toy. No matter what question we asked, wear your masks, Take your vaccines, get your boosters. Yeah, but I, I asked you about exercise. Well, wear your masks. <laughs> One of the questions I posed to Dr. Alexander Scott, a fraud, was, doctor, you spend a lot of time public facing, giving us advice, and people look up to you, clearly. We know, and at this point we did, we know that exercise even moderate exercise, is helpful. We know that sunshine, God bless America, or D3 supplements are good. We know that fresh air is good. Mental health is good for us if we do. We've got all these people locked up in their houses, kids can't go to school. Why aren't you at least telling folks to do that on top of? <laughs> and what was the response? You get to a point where you don't know if you're on hidden camera or not. You just don't, you're, you're, where's the camera? This has to be a joke. It's not, it never was. And it was control, and, and, and Rich Southwell talked about that. It was control, it was absolute control. It was money. Oh, make no mistake. It was, and it still is. It still is. So, through all these hearings, it became very, very clear. We weren't doing anything. There was no real work going on. In fact, in the, the vaccine um, uh, task force, one of the key focuses was to ensure that areas, particularly minority areas, where black and brown communities lived, who were very vaccine hesitant, were focused on, and different um, mechanisms were put in place to ensure that all folks had access to the vaccine. And I mean, I'm not going to repeat everything we all know in this room, but black folks have a little issue with vaccines and stuff being injected in their bodies by the government. Don't know why. I'm sure there's good reason for it, Tuskegee. But we knew there was going to be hesitancy in the population, in the entire population, let alone these particular populations. And yet they double down on all these efforts to, we're gonna go into this community, we're gonna go. They saturated them. There were more vaccines than they had arms and the people were not coming. So that was show. That was show. Uh, oversight was show. When you don't affect a change through what you're doing, it's all a show. It's political theater and that's all it was. So we come back to the State House. Well, actually, we weren't at the State House, of course, because we couldn't get six feet away from each other or something. And we went to the Vets Memorial <laughs> Auditorium. And that was a, a whole other 
train wreck for a whole host of reasons, but um, we, we ended up voting on whether or not we, we eventually are going to cancel this executive order. And, and I, I suspect that that's where Mr. Southwell met my predecessor, uh, Blake Filippi, because there was a glimmer of hope in a lot of our eyes that we're going to have a vote on this. As it turns out, the vote that we had was indeed to stop that executive order. But then after we passed it, they just issued a completely different executive order, <laughs> which did the same, brought us right back to where we were. My colleagues, were, I think four of them dislocated their shoulders, patting themselves on the back. Because, hey, we just did what everybody wanted. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You ingratiated yourselves. And you made yourselves feel important when you really aren't. And we're right back to where we started. How is this good? How is this helping anyone? It's not. So let's uh, fast forward to today. This year. Now, at this point, we realize that they can't be, it can't be a conspiracy theory if it all comes true, right? We realize that at some point. So here we are now in 2023. We've, we've all been freshly reelected, and we're going back there with a renewed sense of vigor. And what we believe is support. Um, a series of bills was, was introduced, some by Republicans, more by Republicans, some by Democrats, but this is not a partisan issue. They they, being those on, on both sides who, who feel the same way, put together bills that everyone in this room would, would, um, would support and, and would appreciate were they to pass. Um, some of the bills, and some are in my name, some are in colleagues' names uh, on both sides. Um, first of all, to get rid of the mandate, just, just outright get rid of it. We should not have a mandate, period. Um, secondly, to enshrine into the law religious and conscientious exemptions, yes. like we've always had yeah. for vaccines, which this isn't. We also had license restoration. Now, there were a few, a few people who did, in fact, lose their licenses, but it was early on, and I suspect they already learned that they were setting themselves up real bad uh, by the time Doc Scully got in front of them, because he, he maintained his license. They just figured another way to screw him. And that's what they did to everybody else. They let them keep their license, but we just won't let you, we won't let you earn a damn thing. We also, um, I, put, I put this one in, I was um, criticized for it, but uh, I'm always criticized, so I don't care. It was essentially creating a protected class. And that protected class was people who refused to get a COVID vaccine. So well, what does that mean, dummy? It means this. It means you would not have to disclose your vaccine status under any circumstances, whether you had it, whether it was current, whether it wasn't, whether you didn't. It's none of anybody's business to ask. Well, what's the precedent for that? We usually do that for um, oppressed minorities, you know, whether it's a race or ethnicity or, or sexual orientation. Yes, it is, absolutely, because those are persecuted classes. Who the hell was more persecuted than people who refused to get vaccines? We were. The devil. We put that bill in. We put a bill in that would immediately restore every job that was lost. So if you lost your job because you refused to get a vaccine, then you would get it back. These were all very, in my opinion, modest and simple things that we could do to move forward. <coughs> We can't go backward in time and erase all the harm that's done. We want it to go forward. We're going to get kicked out. And I, have a, <laughs> and I have an aversion to being kicked out and also a propensity to talk too long. I will wrap it up with this. Um, I'm thankful that everyone is here. I'm thankful that, that Dr. Boston and everybody else has contributed to this. Don't stop. Keep fighting. You're all right. You're all correct. Thank you very much. Thank you.